Felix heard the crash of weapon on weapon, the screams of dying men, the guttural chanting of the orcs, the howled war cries of men. What in the name of Sigmar is going on down there? he asked. Well, it sounds like a battle, Max said sardonically. Your powers of observation astonish me. Felix went cautiously forward to take a look, mindful of the arrows which had almost skewered Gotrek earlier. He looked down and saw that the valley had erupted into a maelstrom of combat. Man and orc and goblin were locked in battle. Most of the human units had managed to restrain themselves from charging and held the higher ground against the more numerous orcs and goblins. As he watched, he saw a rank of halberdiers repulse a charge by a gang of hulking green-skinned warriors. Both sides were taking casualties. The humans pursued the retreating orcs and were themselves caught in the flanks by a gang of crazed goblin warriors. Even as Felix was watching, the men vanished beneath a tide of tiny humanoids only half their size. A strange twanging noise attracted his attention and he glanced over to see one of the oddly garbed goblins clambering onto the giant catapult. The cable was drawn back by a team of sweating lackeys, and then suddenly unleashed. The goblin was ejected into the air and went swooping off towards the human position. It moved its bewinged arms as if believing it could somehow control its direction, and screamed ecstatically as it flew. Maybe it did manage to control it, for it descended on top of one of the human leaders, impaling him with the spike of the helmet. The impact must have broken its neck though, for it didn't rise afterwards. It was an impressive tribute to either its bravery and fanaticism, or its stupidity, for wasting its life like that. Suddenly, other matters urgently required Felix's attention. One group of the orcs had broken away of the general rock, and they were racing up the hill towards them. He rose into a crouch and backed into the cave. They're coming, he shouted. Ugrek spat on the corpse of his dead enemy. So much for waiting, he thought. So much for patience. So much for planning. One shout from that accursed dwarf and those stupid broken-nosed bastards had charged in like the orc boys they were. He would definitely crack a few of their heads once the battle was done. He glanced around. It wasn't all bad tidings, though. He thought that his lads could rout these humans easily enough. And then he would have the axe and the dragon's treasure. It wasn't going to be such a bad day after all. He shouted to his bodyguard and began to make his way across the battlefield towards the mouth of the dragon's cave. He was going to take the axe from the stunty's cold, dead hands. And then he was going to eat the fingers. Johan could see that the battle was finely balanced. The greenskins had the numbers, and their odd weapons and tactics were taking a toll. Those ball-wielding drug fanatics left a path of red ruin behind them until they collapsed in exhaustion or got entangled in their own chains. The flyers had also killed more than a few brave horsemen. The sheer strength and ferocity of the orcs was amazing to watch. He saw one that had to be literally chopped to pieces before it stopped fighting. They did not seem to feel pain as men did. On the other hand, the humans were far better disciplined. They had mostly managed to keep up their ranks and hold the higher ground. The crossbowmen were taking a heavy toll on the lightly armored orcs and goblins. Even a few of those horrid spiders had fallen to them. If only they had a couple of cannons or one of those organ guns or a squadron of heavy cavalry. With one charge, they could have broken the orc ranks. Might as well wish for Sigmar to arrive himself with the host of the righteous dead, Johan thought. They didn't have any knights. They were just gonna have to deal with what they had. He wasn't certain this was possible, though. At least some of the orcs were distracted by attempting to get at the dwarves in the cave and it seemed like the great chieftain, the great Ugrek himself, was trying to cut his way up there. Johan decided he wouldn't want to be there when the man flare arrived, not for all the gold in the dragon horde. Felix chopped down the last orc. He was breathing hard, and blood mingled with the water that saturated his clothes. Some of it was his own. He glanced around the cave mouth. Dead orcs lay everywhere. Godric and Snorri had done their usual bloody work. Between them, they must have put down at least ten of the greenskins. 
5 lay blasted and smoking, a testimony to the deadliness of Max Schreiber's magic. 3 more lay with arrows sprouting from their breast. Felix himself had accounted for 3. He guessed that the others had killed about a dozen. They had taken casualties themselves, though. Standa was dead, his skull split by an orc scimitar. Bjorni had taken a nasty wound. Felix watched Max mutter some kind of healing spell, which knitted the flesh together, then wrap a torn piece of his cloak around it. Bjorni still looked as pale as a corpse, though. He had lost a lot of blood. Ulrika and Oleg moved among the bodies, retrieving arrows to replenish their quivers. About thirty dead orcs, he estimated. It was not enough, though. There were hundreds more greenskins down there, and almost as many desperate men, all of whom would doubtlessly want their share of the treasure. Maybe that was the answer. Maybe they should offer to split it with the humans in return for their assistance. Good idea, he thought. Now all he had to do was to get to the human leader, and then wait for the inevitable treachery if they survived the fight. Footsteps sounded from behind them. He saw Malachi and Uli coming up the corridor. The engineer was bent almost double. In one hand he held a black bomb. He was dropping powder from it onto the ground. Felix knew what he was doing. A spark would ignite the powder. The powder would act as a fuse. The fuse would then detonate whatever cache of explosives they had left back there. It is done, said Malachi. Black powder's in place. If it looks like the orcs are gonna overrun us, I'll set fire to the powder, and boom, the whole tunnel comes down. Then let's see them get at the treasure with a whole mountain of rock on top of it. Felix shivered. He hoped it would not come to this. If it did, it would mean that he and Ulrika would be dead along the rest of them. It was not a reassuring thought. He walked over to the woman. It was time for them to talk. Ugrek chopped down another human, thumped one of his bodyguards who had accidentally blundered into him, and continued to hew his way up the hill. His mighty blade dripped with blood. His axe was smeared with gore. He bellowed instructions and encouragement to the other followers, certain that victory would soon belong to him. Heartened by his presence, the lads fought on with redoubled vigor, cutting down the pinkskins by the dozen. Ugrek could smell victory. Johan ducked back behind a rock. A random arrow had come close to ending his life, and he did not feel like exposing himself to any more. He glanced up, and to his astonishment saw a tiny goblin, his eyes glazed in some kind of trance, go flying overhead. From its arms extended some kind of bat-like artificial wings. On its head was a sharp spike helmet. Johan could have sworn it was shouting... We. This was madness, he thought. The orcs were mad. The goblins were mad. His comrades were mad. And he was mad for staying here when he could actually be running. Unfortunately, he found the entire scene dreadfully fascinating. Off at the valley, two units of orcs had blundered into each other in their eagerness to get at the men. Now they fought each other with the same savagery they had wanted to vent on their human foes. Maybe they were from different tribes, Johann thought. Or maybe it was true what he had heard. When an orc's battle lust was up, it would fight with anything and anyone. A change rippled over the battlefield. He sensed arcane powers at work. His hair stood on end. Something drew his eye to the goblin shaman the way iron fillings were drawn to a magnet. The shaman's cloak billowed behind it. His spider had reared, raising its four forelegs as if in a salute. A yellow glow blazed in the goblin's eyes. A swirling green light flickered at the end of its staff. Streamers of greenish ectoplasm swirled outwards from its tip. When the magic energy touched an orc or a goblin, the recipient's eyes glared reddishly, their muscles swelling like great cables, foam erupting from their mouth, and they fought like berserkers. At each point this happened, the battle started to turn against the humans. Maybe the shaman's uncanny powers would turn the tide, Johan thought. Magic is being unleashed on the battlefield, Max said. I think the shaman has invoked the power of the orc gods. I wish the gods would aid us, muttered Felix. 
Surveying the rent in the chainmail and the agonizing red cut on his side, the wizard was healing. Golden light flowed from the mage's hand, and where it touched the body, the area went first extremely hot and then numbingly cold. It took all of Felix's willpower to keep from screaming. After a moment, the chill passed and sank to a dull ache. He looked down and saw that a flap of skin peeled away by the orc scimitar had knitted together. He could still remember the agonizing pain and the satisfied look on the face of the orc that had dealt the blow. He had turned just too late to parry the stroke. His own blow had beheaded the attacker, though. It had given him a certain satisfaction knowing that he had killed the brood that had fought had killed him. It was a miracle he was not dead. He had managed to keep fighting until the greenskins were repelled and Max could heal him. The gods gave us courage to stand our ground, Manlang, and weapons to cleave our enemies. What else do we need? Gotrek said. An army of Sigmarite Templars would be good, Felix said. I prefer my divine aid to take a tangible form. Gotrek merely grunted and returned his attention to the cave mouth. Snorri stood at the edge of it gazing down. There's a good fight coming, Snorri said. Some big orcs and a shaman on a spider. The spider is Snorri's. You can have it, Gotrek said. The chieftain is mine. Bjorni shook his head. I heard somewhere that female spiders eat their partners while mating. I've met some women who did that too. Don't you ever think about something else? Uli asked. Only when I'm fighting, Bjorni said, and sometimes not even then. Max finished his spell. Felix thanked him and stood up. You're gonna feel real pain in a couple of hours, but the spell should keep you going until then. You won't be up for much fighting, though, unless... Felix knew what Max was thinking. Unless the orcs swarm in, and then I'll have to fight anyway. In a few hours it wouldn't matter since they would be dead anyway. The last wave had left Oleg dying slowly from a stomach wound that not even Max's magic could cure. That could have easily have been him, he thought. If the orc's blow had slightly more power behind it, if the male had not deflected it just enough. The man's groans and prayers filled the chamber and worked on Felix's nerves like poison. It would be a mercy to kill him, he thought and a mercy to the rest of us to silence him. He shivered. He was becoming as bad as Godric and the rest of the dwarves. Worse even, none of them would have ever suggested such a thing. Painfully, he went over to where Ulrika sat beside the dying man, holding his hand. He noticed that both of them were silent now. Oleg's skin looked waxy. His mustache drooped. A small amount of blood trickled from the corner of his mouth. Is there anything I can do? he asked. Nothing, she said softly. He is dead. Suddenly, Felix felt horribly guilty. Ugrek led the lads up the hill. He chopped down a few of the broken noses that were in the way, just to teach them not to do it again, and halted twenty strides away from the cave mouth. He turned for a moment to look back, and saw with some satisfaction that the lads were about to win the battle. The magic of the shaman was definitely helping. Filled by the spirit of the gods, his warriors were fighting as if possessed. The spider had borne its mystic master all the way to where Ugrek stood. No one had interfered with it. It regarded Ugrek with beady, malign eyes, and the war boss wondered whether it was true, and Ixix had bound the spirit of his former shamanic master into it. Not that that mattered. If he gave Ugrek any lip, he would die like anything else. The shaman was gibbering and pointing at something excitedly. Ugrek looked to see what it was. In the distance, he saw a small dot approaching. From the size, he would have thought it was the dragon, but the dwarves claimed they had killed it. It would be just like a stunty to lie about it, and let the dragon escape by another exit. It was too late to worry about such things now, though. Right, lads, he bellowed. Into the cave, kill the stuntes, grab the treasure, leave the axe for me. Having explained this plan, he implemented it instantly. 
Felix watched the inexorable tide of greenskins roll up the hill and knew he was going to die. These were the fiercest, largest orcs he had ever seen, and their leader made even them look weak and mild-mannered. He was huge, half again as big as a normal orc, and he bore a cleaver in one hand and an axe in the other. His cloak of manskin billowed behind him. His tusks were dripping with saliva. His voice boomed out over the battle. Felix noticed that he was looking back at something and looked to see what it was. From beside him, he heard Ulrika gasp. It looks like we might be saved. Aye, if we can hold on long enough, he said sourly. Who said anything about holding on? Gotrek asked. I say we charge. Snorri agrees, said Snorri Nosebiter. Snorri must kill that spider. The slayers plunged downhill to meet the astonished orcs. There was a mighty crash as weapons met and the killing became fast and furious. Johan felt a shadow fall on him and then looked up. Was this more goblin sorcery, he wondered, seeing the vast shape that filled the sky above. No, it didn't look like greenskin work, although it did look like it was powerful magic. To tell the truth, it looked more like dwarf work. It had runes on it and it flew the banners of the Slayer King. This must be the airship that the Slayers had told him about, Johan realized. It was certainly impressive. Even as he was watching, spluttering black bombs began to fall in the middle of the battle. The explosions tore through greenskin and human ranks indiscriminately. Judging from the way they fell, the dwarves were trying to aim for the orcs and the goblins, but they were not trying very hard. It was an impossible task anyway. The two sides were too intermingled for any kind of precision shooting. A roaring noise announced the entry of another dwarf weapon into the battle. From turrets on the underside of the cupola, Gatling cannons roared into life. Shells ripped a man and goblin apart with ease. Johan had seen enough. It was time to get going. Maybe he could find a horse. The sound of explosions and the roar of Gatling cannons told Felix that the spirit of Grugni was doing its bloody work. His prayers had been answered then. The dwarves must have finished repairing the airship and come looking for them. Judging by the new weapons bristling on its sides, they had also come prepared to fight the dragon as well. Felix knew that even if he died here, he would be avenged. Nearby screams drew his attention back to the melee. He watched as Godric tore right through Ugric Manflayer's bodyguard. The dwarf killed an enemy with every blow. Snorri was right beside him. True to his word, he was aiming to get the spider and the rider. Felix wanted to rush down into the melee and help them, but he was tired, and the pain of the wound would make it impossible to fight properly. No, he would stay here and record Godric's doom if it came to him, and hope that the airship arrived in time. Snorri had reached the spider now. It came at him, huge mandibles dripping poison. Snorri ducked its bile, rolled under its belly, and chopped upwards. Felix heard the spider's evil scream and watched it sag in the middle. Snorri rolled out from behind it and lashed out at the rider, but the shaman leapt from the seat to avoid the blow and scuttled away. Powerful he might be, but he didn't have the nerve to face a slayer in one-on-one. Ulrika calmly knocked her bow and fired, knocked her bow and fired. With every shot, an orc fell. The death of her bodyguard seemed to have goaded her into a calm, silent killing rage. Malachi stood next to her, his rocket tube over the shoulder. He took careful aim and pulled the trigger. Sparks flew from the rear of the tube and the rocket whizzed forth, tearing through the orc ranks. Then Malachi threw down the weapon. It is the last rocket he explained, unslinging his portable Gatling cannon and starting to blaze away. Bjorni and Uli fought back to back against the huge orcs. They used their opponent's size against them, expertly, ducking between legs, moving through the press of bodies, hacking and chopping as they went. Felix felt useless and wished he could join them, and then he saw Gotrek had fought his way to the orc chieftain. Ugrek confronted the dwarf with the mighty axe. Good. It saved him hunting down the stunty and killing him. He bellowed a challenge and glared down at the dwarf. Surprisingly, the slayer didn't flinch, which was unusual. 
Ugarek had never met anything on two legs that didn't back away when confronted by his massive shape. This also made him slightly uneasy. Still, it didn't matter. He was twice the dwarf's size and three times the weight. He was the toughest orc who had ever lived. He was going to kill this stunty. He lashed out with the cleaver. Surprisingly, the dwarf wasn't there. That was unusual too. Ugrek knew he was fast for any orc. No one had been able to match his eye-blurring speed before. The dwarf struck back. That was good too. Ugrek liked it when his food put up a fight. It made things more interesting. Sparks flashed as their blades met. The power of the Slayer's blow took Ugrek off guard. He was driven back by the force of the impact. This dwarf was very strong. That was good too. Ugrek would gain some of the strength when he ate his heart. He lashed out with his axe. The dwarf ducked beneath it and aimed a counterblow at the legs of Ugrek. Ugrek leapt above it and brought both weapons down at once, knowing there was no way the dwarf could avoid them both. The dwarf didn't even try though. Instead, he used his axe two-handed and caught both blows in the haft of the weapon. The force of the impact drove him to his knees. He rolled backwards and away, coming to his feet easily. Ugrek was enjoying this. Already, the dwarf had lasted more than any foe Ugrek had fought before, and he was showing no sign of wanting to run. Ugrek had always believed that you could measure an orc by the strength of his foes, and when he killed this layer, all orcs would know that Ugrek was mighty indeed. The thought gave him some satisfaction. The dwarf came at him, beard bristling, a mad light in his eye. He unleashed a hail of blows at Ugrek, each one faster and more powerful than the last one. It slowly dawned on Ugrek, as he parried desperately, that the dwarf had not really been trying before. Being knocked down by Ugrek had goaded him to make a mighty effort. Ugrek was forced to admit that this layer was almost as mighty as him. That was even better. More than ever, Ugrek looked forward to eating his heart. His arms ached a little from parrying the dwarf's blows. It felt like his hand had been nicked. That was unusual. He had never met a foe who had done that before. The slayer aimed another blow at him, and Ugrek raised his cleaver to parry. At the last moment, he realized that the cleaver wasn't there. In fact, his hand wasn't either. The pain he felt earlier was it being separated from the wrist. By the gods, that axe was sharp. He must have it, he thought. It was the last thing to pass through his brain before the axe descended, bringing eternal darkness with it. Felix watched Gotrek finish the orc chieftain. The bodyguards looked panicky, their morale already undermined by the flight of the shaman, the havoc wreaked by the dwarves, and the screaming of their comrades behind them. A few of them turned and looked back to the airship. It was the very last straw. They must have thought the dwarves were gods who had come to punish them. First one, and then another, and another turned and began to flee. Felix looked down to see that the battle had turned into a rout. Orcs and goblins and humans all intermixed, and no longer fighting, streaming out of the valley in all directions instead. The relentless death toll inflicted by the spirit of Grungni was too much for them. I do believe we might actually survive this, Felix said to Ulrika, and then wondered at a look of horror on her face. He turned to see what she was pointing at. A stream of fire was already receding into the depths of the mountain. Malachi's rocket tube lay near at hand. Instantly, Felix realized what had happened. A spark from the weapon had ignited the detonating powder. Could they possibly get down there and put it out? Felix wondered. He knew he would not be able to, not in his wounded condition. And he wouldn't ask Max or Ulrika to try something he wouldn't. He had no idea how powerful the explosive were down there or what the possible consequences of an explosion might be. We'd best get out of here, he said, and tried to move forward, only to discover that his legs were not working properly. He fell forward onto his face. His wound must have been worse than he thought. Go, he shouted, save yourselves. He felt himself being lifted up by Ulrika and Max, and they carried him down the slope towards the dwarves. Prepare yourselves, he heard Max say. 
the tunnel's gonna go up. As the dwarves threw themselves flat on the ground, Felix felt the earth shake. There was a great blast of fire and heat from behind them, and the sound of rocks collapsing and stone grinding against stone. There goes the king's ransom, he heard Uli mutter, and then the sound of dwarf cursing filled the air. Epilogue Felix opened his eyes and saw the steel ceiling of the spirit of Grungne. Borek and Ulrika stooped over him. He could tell by the rocking of the chamber that the airship was in motion. I'm alive then, he said. Only just, Borek said. The wrinkles of his ancient face crinkled benevolently as he was smiling. There was some infection in your wounds. I am surprised that you are alive at all, with what Ulrika here told me of your adventures. Slaying a dragon is not something many men live through. Felix felt as embarrassed as he was pleased. I am glad to see you. I see you managed to repair the airship. Malachi left very specific instructions. Is he all right? He and all the others, although they were all disappointed about the treasure. Is it lost then? Nothing buried below the earth is ever lost to the dwarves, said Borek. It will take a few years to excavate all the rock, but we will get to it eventually. Felix fell silent for a moment, thinking of the bodies of Steg and Grimme. They had received a better burial than anything he could have ever given them. It was an alarming thought, though, that he could have all too easily been buried alongside with them. He reached out and took Ulrika's hand. Don't worry, she said. Max says you'll be up and about by the time we reach our destination. Where are we going? Felix asked, fearing that he already knew. We are going to Prague, she said simply. He shivered, knowing that the greatest chaos army assembled in two centuries would be there as well. The End You've listened to Godric and Felix, Volume 4, Dragon Slayer. Written by William King